Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, good morning to all of you. First of all, I too would like to thank uh, Elder Dumont for welcoming us to your traditional territory. It's good to be here, and it's good to start in a good way. I appreciate that very, very much. What I'd like to try to do is just to put this whole notion of this transitional governance project into context for you. And uh, I'll try not to take too long, and I hope I'll make some sense to you. Uh, my name is Satsan. I'm from the Wet'suwet'en Nation in Northwest uh, British Columbia. I'm an hereditary chief uh, of our nation. I'm from the Frog camp Clan, which is the Flying Frog Clan. And I've been working in and around this area for most of my life. I spent many, many years uh, working on Delgamook and Gestewe, which uh, resulted in the first legal recognition of Aboriginal title and rights in Canadian legal history. And I want to begin by telling you a little story about that. What we did went back to my grandfather's time when the McKenna McBride Commission first came into our territories to establish reserves. And in doing so, he encountered my grandfather, who was Goof Lutt, who was one of the hereditary chiefs of the clan I belong to. And he told them that they had no land to give him. But if they wanted to talk about how he could share with them, then he would talk with them. And of course, we all know what happened. And in amongst our people, the Wet'suwet'en people, the struggle for the recognition of our title and rights in the land began at that time. So it was several generations that this was occurring. And when we were preparing to go into the Supreme Court of Canada on our case, we once again gathered our elders and our chiefs and our people to remind one another why we were doing it, because it took so long. And at this final meeting before going into the Supreme Court of Canada, one of our elders got up and he said, the reason why we're doing this is to create a new memory in the minds of our children. And I went home to my village, which was about 22 miles away, got home about one o'clock in the morning, lying there awake thinking, what did he mean by that? And so when I got up in the morning, I hopped in my vehicle and I drove back to his community. I went to his house, knocked on the door. And he happened to be my uncle. He invited me in and so I said, yesterday you said that this was about creating a new memory in the minds of our children. I said, what did you mean by that? And he said, well, this is the fall time. And this was the time <clears throat> that we recited our oral histories to our children at nighttime before they went to sleep. And we educated them about who they are as Wet'suwet'en people. We taught them about their connection and their obligation to the land and to the animals and to the fish and the environment. We taught them about our laws so that they know how to relate to one another as people. And we taught them about respect, which is our supreme law, because if we treat one another with respect, we'll never have to invoke our law. And he said, since the time of the creation of reserves and the Indian Act, our stories have changed. And now we tell stories of our pain and our anger and our suffering. We've got to get back to a place where we can start to replace those stories with our own 
so that our young people can once again learn who they are as a people, to learn about their homelands and their obligations and their responsibilities to it, to learn about their relationship with their people and our neighbors, and to be able to honor and respect that. And most of all, to be able to look to the future with confidence and hope so that we can replace those stories of pain and anger and suffering with our own stories once again. And last night when I was going to try to go to sleep, and Stephen Cornell was asking me earlier on if I had a good rest, I had a hard time going to sleep, <clears throat> but then I started hearing the voices of our elders and our chiefs as we went through this whole trying time. And I must say that it helped me go to sleep. It helped me have a really good sleep. And I want to dedicate this to their honor and their memory because they did something fantastic and courageous for all peoples across this land. And I want to honor them. <clears throat> the struggle for recognition of Aboriginal and treaty rights and our inherent right to self-government has gone on for a long, long time. And we've tried many different ways to settle the issue. We tried negotiations. We did direct action on the land. We tried the political route over and over again, and ultimately, we ended up into the courts to deal with this. And that's where, like I said earlier, we spent a good part of our time in our life. And we accomplished something there that allows us to come together to talk about a better future for our people and governing ourselves according to our own laws and our own systems. But in traveling to our community to bring this message, I found that a lot of our people heard it but didn't quite believe it. So I had to find another way to tell this. <clears throat> so we did a reconciliation conference at the University of Alberta Law School some years back. And we were talking about the reconciliation between the pre-existing sovereignty of First Nations and the assumed sovereignty of the Crown, a nation-to-nation -nation reconciliation. And we invited then Justice Ian Binney from the Supreme Court of Canada. And I like to use him and his story because in our march through the courts, we encountered him many, many times. And he was a formidable opponent because he usually represented the federal government and or big business and industry against us in the courts. And we nicknamed him uh, the Prince of Darkness because he was formidable. And if you didn't recognize that and if you didn't respect that, he was going to beat your ass. And so we had this grudging respect for him because that's the way you got to deal with it. And now he's on the Supreme Court of Canada. So he came to, into our conference and he made his remarks in the context of an article written by Gordon Gibson in the Globe and Mail. And Gordon Gibson, some of you who may, may not know him, was from a timber baron family on Vancouver Island. He was also former parliamentary secretary to Prime Minister Peter Elliott Trudeau during the 1969 white paper time. And he was also an advocate against Aboriginal title and rights and the inherent right to self-government. And I encountered him many, many times on the road, various press conferences and so on. Anyway, he wrote this article in the Global Mail where he said the Supreme Court of Canada has given Indians too much. And that secondly, where does the Supreme Court of Canada get off on being social activists 
And thirdly, where is the legitimacy in what they are doing? And just as Binney said, we aren't giving First Nations people anything more than they already had, which was pre-existent sovereignty, which they had before contact, which has survived confederation and is now recognized and protected under Section 35 of Canada's Constitution. As far as giving them too much, we've denied them at every turn. In effect, we've forced them into this court, a foreign court, to them. And they came in and they beat us at our own game. So get used to it, Gordon Gibson and the Canadian public. The fact of the matter is that Aboriginal and treaty rights are here. They are recognized and they have to be dealt with. As far as legitimacy is concerned, he said, what's more legitimate than Canada's constitution, which is the highest law of the land? and Section 35, which we, through our own effort as Indigenous people and across this country, put into the Constitution during the repatriation in 1982. <clears throat> he went on further to say that when Section 35 came into the Constitution Act 1982, it was referred to as an empty box of rights because Section 35 says the recognition and protection of existing Aboriginal and treaty rights. And the Crown's position, both federal and provincial, was that there weren't any more existing Aboriginal or treaty rights, so therefore Section 35 was an empty box of rights. Through our effort, through many, many different cases, going from Calder all the way to Chilcotin, including Delgamook and Gisteiwe, Haida. We filled that box up, and Section 35 is now referred to as a full box of rights. And in Justice Binney's words, whose content can only be determined by the people who hold it. And that's us. And that's part of the job that we have to do amongst our people, is to define what our rights are so that we can get organized to implement. So Justice Binney says that Section 35 is now a full box of rights. And in the law, he said, we have to, we can't force anybody to do anything, but we can put in mechanisms and procedures to drive negotiations toward reconciliation. And the reconciliation he was talking about was between the pre-existing sovereignty of First Nations and the assumed sovereignty of the Crown. So along with Section 35 now being a full box, we have the recognition of Aboriginal and treaty rights across the country. We have the recognition of the inherent right to self-government we have the procedures to drive negotiations towards reconciliation in terms of the pre-existing sovereignty and the assumed sovereignty of the Crown. Consultation, Justice Binney referred to as the procedural right. It was there to drive negotiations toward reconciliation. And the way it was set up and the way it's supposed to work is that British Columbia, Canada, and First Nations under Section 35 come forward with their respective legislation and their respective policies. And the, con the consultation right, the procedural right, was a negotiation, a nation-to-nation -nation negotiation between your respective legislation and policies as to how you are going to go forward in terms of this reconciliation and that accommodation 
what's referred to as the substantive right. And what that means is, what do you want to get out of this? And for us, as First Nations people, given our experience in Canada, we are really, really super good at talking about what we don't want and what we don't like. But we need to get a whole lot better at talking about what we do want and what our people need. And so the substantive right is about that. What do we want out of this new nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Canada? What's the relationship that we want going forward in terms of our shared jurisdiction? Because there's no question that we have regained our jurisdiction and there's no question that we've created constitutional space in Canada's constitution for First Nations jurisdiction. We also have the inescapable economic component, which is very, very important in terms of how we raise the revenue to govern and we raise the revenue to provide essential services to our people. If we look at this in terms of the country and realize that we are the land and resource owners and that that's what drives Canada's government, Canada's economy, that's where they get their money to, to govern, that's where they get their money to provide essential services from our lands and resource, the taxation that's there, the fiscal relationship that exists in Canada, we are amongst the highest taxpayers in the country. And we have yet to assume our fair share of that. And we need to be looking at that in a serious way. Where do we get the revenue to govern? Where do we get the revenue to provide essential services to our people? And we need to understand that the relationship that we're talking about is a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. It's about jurisdiction. It's about reconciliation of our pre-existing sovereignty and the assumed sovereignty of the Crown. Section 35 is there. That's where our jurisdiction resides. Section 91 is there, the federal jurisdiction. Section 92, the provincial jurisdiction. And that's where that reconciliation needs to occur. So we've done all that. We've accomplished the recognition that all of our elders and leaders of the past were fighting for. And why aren't we there? I've been doing this a long time. I went out across the country to many, many, many communities saying we've won the recognition of our right. It's time that we begin to work with our people to reorganize our people, to rebuild our nations, to stand on our inherent right and became very, very frustrated and almost sometimes thinking this is impossible. This monster of the Indian Act is so powerful that it just keeps on correcting itself. And through my experience, I realized that I've got to change my approach. And through a research project that we did, John Burroughs did a paper for us on getting out of the Indian Act using our own law. And in the writing of his paper, he realized that this was personal to him. So he looked back in his own life to see how long the Indian Act applied to him and his family. And he realized that he was the sixth generation and that his children were the seventh generation under the Indian Act. And we talk about this notion of seven generations, that we don't do something now that's going to affect our young people seven generations down the road. And I say, that's provided we have the power to affect that like that. 
but through these seven generations under the Indian Act, that power has been replaced by powerlessness, helplessness, and hopelessness. And in fact, now, some of the babies being born today, dependent on where we are in the country, are the eighth generation under the Indian Act. And I realize that we have to deal with the brutal reality of the Indian Act before we can address Aboriginal and treaty rights and the inherent right to self-government. And that's kind of the basis, the context for this transitional governance project. How do we deal with this? The idea, the vision is first of all, we gotta get a handle on this Indian Act, this monster, and we gotta not only master it, but we gotta kill it. And I realize that a lot of our people are afraid of that. And so we have to educate our people as well about the fact of our time in Canada, both before Confederation and after Confederation, and the origin and content of the Indian Act and what it's done to us. And when our people learn that in our experience, there's a 100% consensus decision for change. And we need to go to our people so that we can learn from their vision what they need and want. So that we have clear mandates to deal with the right and the title that belong to our people. So the idea is to master the Indian Act at the outset so that we're not wasting 100% of our time there, but rather to put it in the corner and get so good at it that we're putting 20 to 30% of our time dealing with it and break out that 70, 80% of our time to turn and deal with our people who have been left out as a consequence of the Indian Act and start to reorganize and most importantly to create hope because hope is powerful, powerful medicine for change. I was in Lilwat, Chief Nelson's community, and he was making a short speech to his community. And at the end of the night, one of the elders got up and she said, I always worry about the future of my grandchildren. I always worry about what's gonna happen to them. And the reason why I was always worrying is because I thought that this was all that there is under the Indian Act and on the reserve. And she said to Chief Nelson, who's sitting right here, for the first time in my life, I feel a sense of hope for the future of my grandchildren. So we have to get there. And once we have that conversation with our people and they tell us what they want, then we need to start looking at how do we transition from that Indian Act place to our inherent right? How do we deal with those issues that are before us right now that are beyond the Indian Act so that we can have a place and a context to start? And ultimately, when we deal with our people, their ultimate vision is to be over here within the total realm of their inherent right to self-government. Governing under their own government, according to their own systems, according to their own laws, according to their own principles and values, and their vision for the future. And we need to replace that emotional tension that our people experience with a creative tension to build in a future that meets the needs of our people. And when we can get there, I believe that we can then be in a position to implement our inherent right to self-government 
to take back our rightful place on our lands and also to have that relationship with Canada and the provinces that we always should have had. So the way I look at this in a nutshell, and I'll end here, is to complete confederation. We came into confederation as wards of the crown under section 9124. And if you look at what that means for us, is that we do not have legal status and capacity as natural people. And what are natural people? The definition of natural people are living human beings. So under the Indian Act as wards of the crown, we are not even considered to be living human beings. And it's up to us to correct that. And we need to come back we need to be a part of Confederation as full citizens of our own nations first so that we can deal with Canada in this new way. So that's the context for what we're doing here over the next two days. And we want to build a research agenda that comes from you and your vision and your experience. And the vision, as far as this research project is concerned, is that we will do applied research. That means we'll do research that comes from where you want to start and what you need to help you accomplish what you want to do. And the idea is when we bring this research together from the respective nations, who are all starting from different places, and you consolidate that research and your collective experience, we should end up with a transitional governance model that not only can you all use together, but that's available for other First Nations across the country to use. And that's the, that's the vision around this transitional governance project. And I've been trying to do this and make this happen for many, many, many years. And I'm very thankful to Frances, who's a friend of mine, because I went to her and we tried to do this a couple of times. And we weren't able to pull it off. And then she introduced me to Catherine Macquarie here in Vancouver. So we had a little meeting and she was telling me about a project that she was doing for IPAC. And she said, I like yours better. And uh, I want to be a part of that. So we came together and we created this little team. And we pulled this off. And we did it, I did it, I can only speak for myself here, without a nickel to rub together. Didn't have a dime. This happened through the good graces of very, very generous and like-minded, courageous people. And I wanna thank Francis and Catherine. Aaron back here who worked with me on this for the last couple of years and I have not had a dime to pay her. I have not had a dime to pay myself. My colleagues Chris Robertson, Len Hartley and Paula as well. So thank you very much and I look forward to listening to you for the rest of the time. <laughs>